am going to need a volunteer to help me. Um, it's got to be someone very specific that I need. Um, dun, 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 dun. Bentley, come on up here. Aww. Bentley, come on up here. Real quick, Bentley, Bentley, come on up here. Bentley has helped me many times before, so Bentley, I need you to stand here, and I need you to look that way for me, all right? And just, just how many of you know what a trust fall is? How many of you know what a trust fall is? You fall? All right, real simple, real simple. Bentley, I'm going to stand behind you. Do you trust me to catch you? Are you sure? Are you, are you sure? Bentley, do you trust me to catch you? Why? Because I'm what? Okay, okay. Do you, do you trust me to catch you? Do you trust me to catch you? Okay, I want you to fall. Caught you. Very, very simple. Now, Bentley, what I want you to do is I want you to come and, you know what, stand right here on the edge. And do me a favor and put that on. And look that way. So be careful. Stand with your feet together. Look that way. All right. And I need, I need, who do I need? Um, honey, come here for a minute. You know what? Take your blindfold off for a second. Turn around. So you trust me to catch you, right? Okay. Now, honey is going to catch you. All right. So turn around. Do you, do you, do, hold on. Do you trust that honey will catch you? Are you sure? Why, why do you guess? You don't think anyone will drop you. Honey, do you think you can catch him? Not really. Why can't you catch him? Are you afraid to catch him? Okay, let me ask you again. Do you think that honey will catch you? Why not? She said she wouldn't be. Well, do me a favor. Turn around and look at the wall. 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 Don't look at anything else. Turn around and look at the wall. Turn around. Look. All right, I want you to trust me that honey's going to catch you. Do you trust me? Do you trust me? All right, I want you to fall. I want you to fall. I want you to fall. Trust me. Trust me. Take your blindfold off. Hey, thank you. Thank you very much. All right, all right, all right. Now, now let me ask you, let me ask you again. How many of you have done a trust fall before? Now, see, it's so interesting to me that we are so confident. We are so confident when we know who's going to catch us. When we know we're going to fall, we know that we put our full trust and our trust is placed and the person that's going to catch us. See, Bentley trusted me when I was close to him. But when I walked further away, he's like, ah, no, I don't think so. And then when Bentley was up on the stage, it got a little higher. But then I told him to put a blindfold on. And then I told him that Honey was going to catch him. And then when I asked Honey, do you think you could catch him? She said, no. He instantly what? Did not trust that she could do it. And so trusting is something that is so important for us, and trusting is something that I really want to talk about tonight. Because is it really easy to trust people? Ah, it all depends, right? It all depends. It depends on who the person is. It depends on how long you've known the person. It depends on a lot of things. And like to really trust someone and to really like put it there, it's really hard sometimes. Do you know oftentimes it's harder for us to trust people that we know really well? And so I was thinking about this concept of trust, and, and, and I, like, when I say, do you trust someone, what do I mean? I mean this. I mean, do you have a firm belief in their character, in their strength, or in the truth of someone or something? See, many of you have placed your trust in people before, and those people have let you down. Or you, have, you believed with your whole heart that, that this person would never, ever betray their trust, but you did. Now, see, like, I don't know if any of you have been to youth camp with us or youth retreat with us, and oftentimes, 
I, you know, I will play dodgeball with everybody else. And there's always that one, that one kid that will come up to me. It's usually a sixth or seventh grade boy. He's like, yo, Pastor Mike, I'm going to get you out. I was like, no. He's like, do me a favor. Don't throw a ball at me. I'm like, trust me, dude. I won't throw a ball at you. Soon as we go, bullseye right in the, I'm hitting him right in the head. Bah! Bah! Knock him right out. And he'd be like, you told me you wouldn't. I was like, well, you trusted me. You shouldn't have trusted me. It's dodgeball. There's no trust in dodgeball. There's no trust in dodgeball. Now, for me personally, if you were to put a million, million dollars in cash at my feet, and you said, hey, for the next hour, can you guard this? I would have no problem. I could guard it 100%. I would not be tempted to take any of it. I would actually be like, yeah, dude, like, I 100%, I'm not going to touch your money. You can trust me with your money. So when it comes to a million dollars just laying at my feet, and you want me to, trust me, I will not let anything happen to this. I won't let anyone take it. I won't take it. You can trust me. So you could trust me with a million dollars. But if you get me some fresh donuts at Mamie's, and you put them on a table in front of me, and you put me in a room by myself, and you say, don't touch the donuts, that is a whole other level. Okay, I'm not tempted by the million dollars, but the donuts, you're going to get me because I, like, the donuts will definitely get me. That's just the type of person I am. Now, for me personally, I don't know if you are like this. Do you ever get real big into a movie and you fall in love with this character and you love the character and you're like, oh, this character is great. Whether it's the hero, whether it's the villain, no matter what, we connect with this character. But you know what always happens to one of the characters? They always get betrayed. Always. always. They always get betrayed. Their trust is placed in someone, and they place that trust in someone, and what happens? Oh, their best friend stabs him in the back. Not only stabs him in the back, takes his woman, takes his house, takes his dog. Not the dog. Uh, not the dog. Can't take the dog. But this is what happens, and we understand this concept of trust because of culture, because of reading books, and part of trust has become so ingrained in our lives because of movies and literature and what we know. Trust is something we all have in common. We have trusted people, and we haven't trusted people. So tonight, I want to talk to you about a story that we find in the Bible that actually really shows us what the most pure trust could ever be. Because tonight's story, we're going to pick up where we left off a few weeks ago on the Tower of Babel. So God had uh, commissioned these people to go out into the world and to spread all over. But they didn't. They built this whole tower. Remember, we talked about the memorial of me. How it's all about me and I want to show them who I am. And so these people built this tower. Why? So they could show everyone how great they were. And God's like, no, this is not the plan. So he confused their language and he gave them different languages and they had to spread out. So here we are picking up in a story where these people have spread out all over hundreds of years later. And people are all over the world now. And this is where we're going to pick up and we're going to talk about this man tonight that was asked to trust to go somewhere and to do something when he couldn't even see the person that was asking him to do it. Check this out, Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. It said, The Lord said to Abram, Leave your country, leave your people, leave your father's household, and go to the land that I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse those who curse you. And all the people on the earth will be blessed through you. So verse 4 said, So Abram went as the Lord had told him, and, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he set out from his home Haran. He took his wife Sarah, his nephew Lot, all of his possessions that he accumulated, and the people that they had acquired in Haran, his hometown, and they set out for the land of Canaan until they arrived there. So what I want to look at is, let's go back to that first verse, because I want you to catch what God is saying to this man named Abram. So there's this man, Abram, that just seems to, seems to just, God recognizes him, and this is a good man, and it says, God wants you to leave your country. In other words, he wants him to get up and leave. I want you to leave your friends. I want you to leave your family. I want you to leave everything that is familiar to you, and I want you just to go. 
Now listen, if God like popped up to you and was like, hey, listen, you need to leave Altoona, some of you have been like, my bags are packed. Like I'm ready to get out of Altoona ASAP. But some of us will be like, nah, I don't think I want to do this. This is where my friends live. This is where my family lives. This is where I know. I know, the, I know the school. I know the culture. I know the city. I don't want to leave here. But here's the thing. He asked this guy to leave everything he knew, and he asked this guy to leave what he knew was safe. See, one thing we all like to be is we like to be safe. We don't like to be in places or positions of danger. No one likes that. And so this place of safety is connected. Abram being at home, it's a safe place because he knows it. He knows all the people. He goes down to the, the market. He knows everyone there. He goes and sells this. He goes and sells that. He knows everyone everywhere. And that's what is important is that he is familiar with this. But then all of a sudden God says, okay, I literally need you to pack up everything. And I need you to go somewhere. And I'll tell you when to stop. Just go. Just go to where these places are. Oh, and we mentioned that Abraham's already 75 years old at this point. So he's already pretty much established. He's already pretty much set in his ways. He automatically, Abram was a very rich and wealthy man up to this point. The Bible says that he had lots of possessions. He had lots of family. He was very wealthy. So listen, like, this dude was set. He did not have to leave. He did not have to go. Where he was from was a very financially wealthy place. The dude did not have to leave. He did not have to go. But literally God says to him, you need to leave. He's not talking to some young kid that's wanting to seek out adventure. He's talking to a man that's already settled, a man that has everything he needs and everything he wants, and he's worked hard to be where he's at. So you guys remember in the Tower of Babel, you had all these people who wanted to make a name for themselves, and they wanted to build this memorial so that people would recognize them. And it's like God says, no, that's not the way this is going to work. I'm going to use this certain man to make it happen. But the question that God had for Abram is, do you trust me? See, we talked about trust in the beginning. Do you trust me if I'm with you? Do you trust me? There's many times that I, in, in years of ministry with teenagers, we've gone through a situation that I say, you have to trust me. Just trust me. If you trust me, I'm not going to lead you the wrong way. But ultimately, we have to understand that God doesn't call us to easy places. He causes us to go to places that are going to change us and that we're going to change. God wants you to change places, but God wants to change your heart more importantly. See, you got to understand that every one of you is going to have a calling on your life where God is going to ask you to do something. Maybe he's going to ask you to go to a certain school, maybe to go to a certain college, maybe to go do a certain profession. Some of us were talking before, and we were talking about, hey, what do you want to do when you get older? I want to do this, I want to do that. And that's so awesome that you have dreams and that you have these things that you would love for God to do. But you've got to understand that at some point, God is going to say, listen, you need to do this. And in, in our culture of Christianity, and oftentimes here, you'll hear me use the term called. Called or calling. And, and let me explain to you what that means and, and kind of the, the definition of that because I don't want you to ever be confused when we talk about called or calling because each and every one of you have a calling that God has placed upon your life. Now, when I was a kid growing up outside of Pittsburgh, we often had these, uh, these woods. They're not there anymore. They tore them all down and built these houses. But there's all of these woods, and all of my friends, we, there's a big group of us neighborhood kids that would always hang out together. And, um, and it was on Adeline Avenue and Mount Lebanon, and we had all these woods behind our house. We'd always hang out together. We'd go in the woods and build forts, and we'd go, you know, and fight each other with, with you know, whatever, sticks, stones, whatever we could find. You know, guys, they, they, we did all that. We would ride our bikes all through the woods. There's pathways. It was one of the coolest experiences that I had as a kid. Now, we would oftentimes go play as soon as we got home from school till it got dark out. But there was always one thing that we knew. We knew that when it was time to come in, we had the one mom in that neighborhood. That one mom. You know what I'm talking about. That one mom that when she whistles, everyone hears. Like, everyone. So this lady would whistle, and it would be, hey, it's time to come in. Everybody come in. And when she would whistle, all of the kids would go home. Everyone would go home, no matter who you were. And now, like, she would whistle, and the animals would follow us. Like, everybody is going home because she was, making, she was calling out to us to say, hey, it is time. Now is time. It's done. It's finished. You need to come inside. So there was a calling that went out to us when we were out there that we would recognize, and we'd be like, okay, we're coming in. 
Many of you know that I have an amazing dog named Timber, who is like my favorite dog in the world. Timber is my buddy. We hang out all the time. I talk to Timber like he is actually like a human all the time. We have, do you ever notice you have weird conversation with your pets? You ever sit there and you're like, you're talking like 15 minutes later, you're like, am I really having this conversation with you? But Timber is my dude. And so what's interesting though is we will go places and we will take Timber out and he'll be out in places and there can be a lot of people there. But as soon as I call his name, he listens to me and hears me calling. And he'll follow me and he'll come. And like he'll follow me. where It doesn't matter where we're at. We can be out. But as soon as I call his name, the dog will follow me. Why? Because he knows my voice and he knows that I am calling him. See, when I'm talking about calling, this is what I'm talking about. The call is God speaking to you. He's communicating to you. And he's wanting you to understand what he's saying to you. In order for you to understand the call of God, listen to me tonight, guys. I want to help you, walk you through this. In order for you to understand the calling, the purpose, what God wants you to do, there are three steps that oftentimes happen when you are called to do something. First one is this. When you are called to do something, oftentimes there is going to be a leaving, you have to leave, he said, leave your country, your people, and your father's household and go to the land that I will show you. When you look this up in scripture, it actually means leave, get out, go right now. Immediate, it's an immediate leaving. It's one of those things where you're like, when you're fooling around, your mom's like, let's go. And you're like, I don't, I don't know, let's go right now. You're like, okay, I got to go. You know, it's that, it's that mom voice. It's that voice that's like, I got to go right now. See, when we're talking about this, when it says that he was called to leave his country, God is saying, right now. Well, again, you got to understand something. I want you to get this. He was living in a place called Ur of the Chaldees. Ur was, was this absolutely beautiful city. Ur is compared to a modern city that we might have today that has libraries and a system of law and, and school. And it was a rich city. It had many valuable treasures. And it has a lab jewelry. It, I mean, it was absolutely a, a city before its time. It was absolutely beautiful. And it was one of these places that was absolutely important. And Abraham was, or Abram was an important man in this city. And this is where God says, you need to leave all of this. You need to get out of here. But you got to understand this. The Bible is very clear on something that I'll, I'll speak on another time. Abram's father, so Abram's father was one that settled in that area. And according to, to Joshua chapter 24, we find that um, Abram's father worshipped idols. And in the city that he lived was dedicated to this worship of idols. And Abram, listen to me, I want you to catch this tonight because some of you, this is for you. Abram was not raised in the best environment. Abram was, Abram was not raised in the best place that he should. Abram was not raised in a place that, that, that was, that was going to cultivate him as a man of God. Abram was not in a place that he should be. And so what God said is you need to leave. And it says that God spoke to Abraham, and Abraham believed that, that God was speaking, so he left. I love this verse, Hebrews 11.8. It says this, By faith, Abraham when he was called to go into a place which he should have received an inheritance, obeyed, and he went out, not knowing whether he went, not knowing where he's going. By faith, Abraham was called to go somewhere, and he's like, listen, I'm bouncing, I'm going. This, I, I, like, I, I'm not going to fool around. I'm going to do this. Abram was not confused in what he was called to do. See, it's funny. We played this game tonight. We had you all line up, and it's called Silent Telephone. And we do a action down here, and we want to see what the action looks like at the end. And obviously, when you're not communicating and you're not allowed to talk, it's very confusing to understand what's happening. And so this was a lesson to us tonight that oftentimes we have to be very clear with what is being communicated so that we don't get confused. Abram was not confused. He did not confuse God's voice with an idol's voice. He knew it was something different. He knew there was something different about this voice that was speaking to him. And he said, I got to listen to this voice. I got to listen to this voice. This voice is, has wisdom. There's something about this voice that sounds really, really good. And can I tell you that, let's just be honest, one of the hardest things in life for us to navigate is between all the voices. Because we have a lot of voices in our life that are telling us to do certain things. 
There's voices that say you need to do this, you need to do that, you need to do this, you need to do that. And so navigating between all of the voices and saying, okay, which is the voice that I, I should listen to? Trying to figure out and decipher all of these things. See, I want you to know, and I've talked about this before, just like God is for you, the enemy, Satan, the devil, is against you. And you got to understand, if you want to be clear in the voices that you're hearing, see, oftentimes what Satan will do, he'll start with what you've done, and he'll beat you up about all the things that you have done. You've messed up. You feel guilty. You feel horrible for what you did. Satan does that. He loves, to, he loves to remind you of how terrible you are. He loves to remind you of how much you screwed up. He loves to remind you that you'll never amount to anything. He loves to remind you that you're not worthy. He loves to remind you that you have no value. Satan loves to remind you of all these things. You screwed up. You're stupid. You're not smart. You'll never amount to anything. This is the way Satan communicates. So if we're listening to that voice, what happens? We begin to believe that. But understand this. There's another voice where God says, you have done these things, but they don't define who you are. God starts with who you are, and he speaks into what you will do. You are going to be amazing. You messed up, but you're going to be amazing. You're going to be wonderful. You're going to do an incredible amount of things. You're going to get through this. You're going to get over this. Your life does have value. See, you got to understand that the voices, there's one voice that's saying something that's going to tear you down, and there's going to be one voice that's going to build you up. And it's being able to understand those things. So part of calling, you gotta understand the first part is sometimes you're gonna have to leave what is familiar. Whether that's a familiar lifestyle or whether that's even geographically, like I gotta go to a new place, I gotta get out of here, I gotta get away. Leaving the familiar things will help you walk toward the faith things. You gotta understand that. Leaving the familiar things will help you walk to the faith things. That's where God wants you. He wants you to be using your faith to believe in things. There are some things in my life, guys, I'll be totally honest, that I have absolutely, like, really small faith in. Then there are other things I got huge faith in. Like, I'll tell the guys sometimes, don't worry, God's going to take care of us. Things I should be freaking out about, nah, it's good, God's got us, he's going to take care of us. And then things I shouldn't be freaking out about, I'm freaking out. I'm like, God, are you even there? Like, what is even going on? And the things that I, I should have faith in, but we got to understand that sometimes you got to leave the things that are familiar to go after the things that are faith. Because faith is what changes your life. See, God wanted Abram's dependence to be fully on him. So he said, leave. Abram's like, I don't know where I'm going, but I'm going. I mean, imagine being like, listen, guys, we're going to pack up and leave. You'd be like, where, where am I going? Where am I going? Half of you would be like, are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? I've traveled with a lot of you, I understand. But we have this concept of we want to know where we're going, but God's like, listen, don't worry about it. I'll tell you when you get there. For people that are planners, that like to plan, that would drive you insane. Those of you that like planning and lists and like to know where everything's going and be like, ah, nope, we're just going to go and, you know, when we show up, we show up and we get there, we get there, and that's it. But sometimes you are called to leave the things in response to the call. Number two is this, understand that in the call there's a making I love this part. There's a making. It says, I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you, and I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. Listen, to, if God said to me, Michael, listen, I'm going to make you great. I'm going to make your nation great. I'm going to make your family great. I'm all in. Let's do this. Let's, let's, let's do this in the making. Let's make it happen. But can I tell you that the making is not always as great as it sounds, See, part of responding to the call is not just a response with your mind, but it's a response with your actions. You can think one way, and you can be like, I know this is the right way to do it, but if you actually don't do it, it doesn't mean anything. So part of responding to God is saying, okay, I believe this in my mind, and now I'm going to believe it in my actions. And I'm going to actually do this. I'm going to step out in faith. I'm going to step out big like God wants me to, and I'm going to make this happen. Anytime something great is made, there's a process it has to go through. 
in order for Abram to make himself and uh, uh, allow God to make him into a great name, into a great nation, there was a process that he had to go through. Let me just read some of the things real quick that we'll, we'll talk about over the next several weeks of Abram, um, who becomes Abraham. But some of the things that Abram has to go through in order to become great is this. At 75, he has to leave and move somewhere unknown with unknown people. After he leaves, he has to run to Egypt. He lies to Pharaoh and Pharaoh about his wife. Then he's scared that he's going to be killed. He had to rescue his nephew from five kings that wanted to kill him. He had a promised land that he would have a son, and he said, I will promise you a son. He had to wait a hundred years in order to get to this point. He had a different son than the one that was promised, and his name was Ishmael, and Ishmael would always cause problems in Abraham's life. Once he had a son, he was told he needed to sacrifice his son. He watched the city be consumed with fire. He watched his nephew be turned into a pillow of salt. His wife died before he did. Then he had to go find a wife for his son. See, part of the making process is not going to look very nice. Part of making you into what God wants you to be, it's not going to be easy. It's not going to be easy. If you were to talk to any of the adults in the room, if you talk to anyone that's older than you that has been walking with God, they'll tell you, like, I, I might look like I'm in a good place, but you have no idea what I went through to get to this place. You have no idea how I had to walk through certain things in order to become who I am today. See, Abram had to go through a making. And, yo, being a great nation sounds good. Being a great man sounds wonderful. Having a heritage of a family, that's great. That sounds amazing. But are you willing to go through the making to become great? In order for God to use you to be great, you have to be willing to accept the calling to leave and to go to certain places and do certain things, but then you've got to accept the calling that you are going to go through the making because after the leaving and after the making, the third thing is this, then you receive the blessing. Because he said, I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will curse them and, I will, and the earth will be blessed who? Through you. See, the final part of this calling that God has for you is a blessing to do good things with your life. He promised Abraham three things, land, a great nation through his descendants, and a combination of the two that would affect the nations of the entire earth. Understand this, that even today in 2020, over in Israel, we are affected because of Abraham's obedience to God. I don't have time to get into it. Matt doesn't have time to get into it. He probably knows a little bit more than I do about that, that specific thing. But we are literally still living Check this out. In 2020, in this room tonight, in Altoona, Pennsylvania, we are still living under the blessing of Abraham's obedience to God. It's called, the, it's called, it's called Abraham's blessing, Abraham's covenant. We are receiving from that because that man said yes to God. That man said yes to I will go and I will do this. See, God's promise and the blessing extended not only to his physical family, but also to all those all those who would be engrafted into becoming Christians and followers of Jesus. Galatians 3 says this. So in Jesus, all of you are children in God through faith. For all of you were baptized into Christ and clothed yourselves in him. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free nor male or female. For all of you are one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, what does it say? Then you are Abraham's seed and are honored and you're connected to that according to the promise. So because of Abraham's obedience, I can have a relationship with Jesus. That's how that works. Why? Because of the blessing that he chose to live in. Guys, you got to understand calling. Each one of you are called to something. God wants each one of you to do something amazing. And in that calling, it's going to be a crazy. But understand this. The call of God is for you. It's for those that will be around you. And it will be for those that are ahead of you. Listen to me. What God wants to do with your life, again, listen to me. Everybody look at me. I want you to understand this because this is so important. What God wants to do in your life, it's for you. Those that are around you and those that will come ahead of you, those that, people in the future, your obedience to God is going to affect generations. Your yes, your yes will impact multitudes of people. But you have to be willing to say, God, I'm obedient to the call. You have to be willing to say, yes, I accept that, God, you want to do something in my life. If God chose 
to establish a promise with a 75-year-old man who dropped everything and said, in obedience, I will follow. Just imagine what God can do with you at your age. Just imagine what he can do with you. No matter where you're at in your Christianity and your faith journey, whether you're committed and active and you come to refuge every week and you go to church every Sunday, or if you just, you know what, like I I love Jesus and I'm living for him, whether you're young in faith or deep in faith, it doesn't really matter. God has a calling on your life to do something great. It might not be in ministry. It might not be in a church. It might be somewhere in another city. It might be somewhere in another part of the world. It might be somewhere where you've never even been before, never even heard of before. It might be to do something that you don't even think that, like, is not even in your mind right now. But God's like, listen, I got something special for you. Why? Because Jesus is for you and everyone else around you. And so the biggest question is, are you willing to trust God to take you to those places? I want you to think about that. Are you willing to trust God to take you to those places? Because what it's going to feel like sometimes, it's literally going to feel like you have a blindfold on. That you have absolutely no idea where you're going. You have no idea where God is, like what God is doing. Sometimes Christianity is like wearing a blindfold. Where you're like, okay God, I don't know, I can't see, but I'm going to trust for you to take me where I need to go and, what, and do what I need to do. But sometimes it's, it's hard because you can't see anything and you don't know, but you just have to trust. You just have to know. You just have to believe. What, God, I trust and believe in you that you're going to do something amazing in my life. Because each and every one of us want God to do something amazing in our life. And if we just owe obedience to him, he will. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. So tonight, the question I pose to you, I don't want anyone, I don't want anyone talking. I don't want anyone looking around. I just want you, you and God for a few minutes. A few minutes. My question to you tonight, do you trust God? Do you trust God? See, it's easy to trust God in the things that you can see. The things that are around you already, it's so easy to trust God in those things. But do you trust God with the things you cannot see? Do you trust God with the future? You might be like, hey, I can trust God right now and what's going on. Yo, it's easy to trust God when you're in church. It's easy to trust God when things are great. It's easy to trust God when you're at refuge. It's easy to do all these things. But can you trust God when things are messy? Can you trust God when you don't know? Can you trust God when all things go dark? Can you trust God to take you where he wants to take you to do what he wants to do with you? See, have this understanding that God has amazing things that he wants to do in your life. And you got to understand that he really wants to take you somewhere deep. He really wants to do amazing work in your life. But you have to believe in that. But as I was preparing this tonight, I thought of a few things. Number one is this. First and foremost, do I trust God to forgive me of my sins? Do I really trust God that he can forgive me of the things that I have done? Messed up big. Messed up bad. Done some things I shouldn't have done. But do I really trust in God that he's going to be able to forgive me of those things? Second thing is, do I really trust in God that he's going to take care of me? Because there's been a lot of people that said they're going to take care of me. There's been a lot of people in and out of my life that, that have come in and out. And it's been a revolving door in my life. So can I really trust God that he's always going to be there? Can I really trust God that he's going to stick closer than a brother? Can I really trust God when he says he loves me? Can I really trust God that he's going to do something amazing with me? Because some of you, how you view yourself, you don't think anything amazing can happen in you. And that's a lie of the enemy because God says, no, I'm going to do something amazing in your heart and in your life. See, we got trust issues, big ones, because we live in a culture where trust is constantly violated. We live in a world where trust is just thrown out the door all the time and we're so familiar with what it is to to not trust people, we forgot what it is to trust people. We forgot what it is to have that pure and holy and great trust. And so tonight, my question is to you, do you trust God for these things? 
Do you put your full faith in God and trust in him that he's going to take care of these things? Because I can tell you tonight that he will. I can tell you tonight that God wants to do amazing work in your life. And I can tell you tonight it's going to be, it's going to be some leaving. It's going to be some making. But it's definitely going to be a blessing that you're going to be able to receive. And so tonight, I want you to pray with me. If you're like, listen, I got trust issues with God, I want you to pray with me because I got my own trust issues with God sometimes. And we're all in this together. So if you want to pray with me, you can pray with me. If you want to pray out loud in your head, whatever you want to do, but let's pray. God, you heard what was said tonight, and you know that I got trust issues. You know that I have a hard time believing that you forgive me sometimes. I have a hard time believing that my life has value. I have a hard time believing that you're going to use me. But God, tonight I'm done with my trust issues. And I'm going to trust you. And I'm going to love you. And I'm going to live for you. So forgive me tonight. And help me fall deeper in love with you than ever before. And help me trust you each and every step of our life. God, that is my prayer to you tonight. That you will help me with my trust issues. God, I pray that as we continue on this journey, that you will continue to allow us to fall deeper in love with you. You will continue to allow us to know you more and more. And we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen.